Hey YCIES, welcome back for another assembly. I hope you had a good weekend and as we get ready for our experiential learning days, I hope that you have a, a wonderful week and learning some new some new skills and doing something a little bit different outside the, the normal structure of the, uh, the regular school day. Um, for today's assembly, I want to kind of prepare for this theme. I've been talking about how we want to talk about Jesus's Sermon on the Mount and some of the things that he taught that kind of changed the way even the world is today, 2,000 years later. But I'm a little delayed on that because we're actually filming a little surprise and we're hoping to have it ready in about another week or so. But as we kind of prepare for that, um, I wanted to talk about something that I think might have some application as we prepare to uh, talk about that topic. Uh, I wanted to talk about today is the notion of getting God's approval. Now, uh, for those of you that believe in God, uh, there may be a desire to, to do things in order to get God to approve of what you're doing or to approve you. Um, I know many Christians can you know, maybe do church more often or read their Bible more often or pray more often, do things that they feel will get God's approval. Um, if you come from another religion, maybe there is, there's uh, also things within that religion where you try to get God or God's approval. And even if you have no uh, religious faith, we, I think we all are susceptible. We're, we're all prone to trying to seek the approval of those around us. It, it's, a, it's a trap I think we can fall into. I, I've done it myself. Uh, it's, a, it's a reality I think we all kind of wrestle with. But I wanted to share with you today maybe something that can help you um, break out of maybe some of the thought patterns that makes us want or feel a need to seek the approval of others. So I wanted to talk about how do we get God's approval? Because I know as a, as a Christian, if I have God's approval, it affects my desire or need to have the approval of others around me. I mean, we spend a lot of time in our lives, if we're really honest, trying to get people's approval. I mean, our friends' approval, our parents' approval. I mean, I'm 54 years old. I still kind of want my parents' approval. Um, teachers' approval, even sometimes strangers' approval. Isn't that funny? I mean, even strangers, we want their approval. Uh, I mean, let's look at Instagram and social media. We do so many things. Facebook, we get, we get uh, the right profile picture. We get everything just set to be able to project an image of ourselves, really to get people's approval, to get their likes, to get their comments. Um, it can be a vicious trap. But I wanted to share, like I said, about how do we get God's approval? And what does it mean to actually be a child of God? And here's the thing. When Jesus came, he changed the notion of how people understood God to be. Up until the time of Jesus, most religions had some idea of God being a Zeus-like character. Uh, depending on the culture and depending on the religion, uh, there was this all-powerful God or gods, and they were distant. They were in, you know, Mount Olympus or, or um, you know, the, these, uh, where, where's Thor and, and Odin from? Um, Asgard, but, um, and, and they were always far away and you sought to get their approval and their favor so that they would give you blessing, that they would make your life a little bit easier. Jesus comes on the scene and he shares a radical new way of viewing God. He, he shows us how to see God as a loving father, that it's not, God is not some distant being out there somewhere, but he's actually an intimate father who sees you as a child, that sees you as a son or as a daughter. And uh, in fact, Jesus says at one point that it, it is by the Spirit of God that we are able to say the words Abba, which was the Greek for Papa, you know, a very intimate term of relating to your parent, that it's not even just father, but it is Papa, that God wants and desires to have this relationship of Papa, of Abba, with you, with his children. And Jesus demonstrates this during his life on earth. He, dis he demonstrates this intimate relationship with God the Father that he uh, teaches us to emulate, that we can have that same relationship with God. See, sonship and daughtership is, at its root, a declaration. It's a statement, not so much from son to father, 
but from the father to the son in Jesus's case, or to, to the daughter if, if you're a female. And, and it's basically that parent saying, I love you, you are my joy, and you will never be alone. It's not surprising then that God the Father declares his love and pleasure with Jesus at two very distinct points in his life. The beginning of his ministry or the time where he was beginning his work that he, he would become to be known for, and at the end of that work, just before he dies on the cross. In the book of Matthew in the Bible, in chapter 3, we see the first time that God the Father makes this declaration of love towards Jesus. And the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So right at the beginning of Jesus's ministry or his work, this declaration of love comes from the Father. See, it's interesting to note that Jesus hadn't done anything to earn this declaration at this point. Uh, he, he hadn't done all the famous things he would shortly become known to do. Uh, he hadn't healed any lepers. He hadn't re restored sight to anybody who was blind. He hadn't calmed any storms, as we would later find out that he will do. Um, he hadn't forgiven any one of their sins, of their shortcomings, or anything like that. He hadn't preached one sermon about the kingdom of God or, or how God is operating in the world. We have no record of him having done anything for God at this point. No, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, he was just this guy. He was a carpenter. That's what he did. He was a manual laborer. And it's not like he had these qualities that would make him stand out. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that would say we would desire him. Like there, you know, you meet some, some of these big stars and they, they have this great speaking voice, or they're so good looking, or they just have this certain quality that makes them a star. And that's why people would follow them, or that's why we, we go to their movies, or we follow them in sports or in music, because they have this quality. But the Bible says Jesus didn't have these qualities. He just was this regular guy. But he had something that had transformed him inside, and the way he engaged with the world. And this, and, and this is what it was. He walked in the absolute assurance that he was God's son and that his father in heaven absolutely adored him. He had this identity that he knew he was loved and he was able to walk in confidence with that, that understanding. That relationship with God was solid, that, that there was nothing he could do or not do that would separate him from the love of his father. And when people have that kind of identity, it transforms the way they interact with their environment around them. Jesus knew he didn't have to do anything to prove himself to God. He did not have to earn his father's affection. And then here's the interesting thing. That was at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Uh, roughly three years later, Jesus did ministry, or he did his, his miracles and his preaching and his teaching for about three years. Then he experiences the exact same affirmation at the conclusion. He enters Jerusalem where he would ultimately be crucified. And as he, he's kind of hanging outside the city a few nights before, he takes three of his disciples up on a mountain. The Bible says he, taking Peter, James, and John up a mountainside, the disciples witnessed the Father once again pronounce his love and pleasure for his son. Again, the book of Matthew, chapter 9, or I'm sorry, chapter 17, says uh, in verses 7 to 9, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. 
Now, at this point, Jesus had accomplished many great things. He had healed the sick. He had cast out all kinds of infirmities. He did show his power over nature, and he had proclaimed the kingdom of God and that it had come. And yet he received the exact same declaration of love and affirmation as when he had done nothing. Nothing had changed. God loved him and approved him at the beginning. God loved him and approved him at the end. And all that stuff he had done in between had nothing to change the intimacy, the relationship, and the affirmation that Jesus received from God. Now, Jesus had such an impact with people because he communicated this total adoration and compassion that God had for his children without that added nagging sense of obligation, the sense of burden that often religious leaders could, can put on people. Um, it, it's, it seems like in human nature, it's not just religious leaders. I mean, we all, there's all kinds of things in society where there are these expectations put on us that we translate, if you do this, you will be approved. If you do good things, you'll get the thumbs up. If you do bad things, you get the slap on the wrist. You, you feel like you have to earn people's approval. And this unfortunately happens in religion too. Uh, sometimes people put their own shortcomings on God and convey to others somehow that we can either earn or lose God's approval based on our actions. Um, now, that's not to say that God's not disappointed with um, when we do something, or, you know, maybe hurtful to someone else. Um, I can speak for my old children. This is the way that I uh, interact with my own children. My children know that they have my unconditional love no matter what they do. They can do great things and I'll love them. They cannot do great things and uh, good things and I'll love them. That's not to say that if they do something that's hurtful to themselves or to people around them, that I'm not disappointed, that I'm not sad. I might have a talk with them. You know, that's not to say that God like is, is oblivious to, to wrongdoing, but we need to know that, that his love for us is not lost. His affirmation for us is not lost based on our actions. We have a relationship. We have a position in his family that cannot change. So we don't accomplish great things and then God loves us. It's when we understand how much God loves us that we're empowered to accomplish great things. So I wanted to leave you with kind of that idea of where do, where do you seek your approval? And do you sometimes find yourself looking for people's approval? I've got a couple reflection questions, and I hope you have some time to be able to maybe think about this, reflect on this. And the two questions are this, do you find yourself doing things just to get the approval of others? Um, I think if we're honest, we all have to say yes. I don't think anybody, including Mr. Hackman, would say no to that, okay? Um, so we might want to also add, um, why do we find ourselves doing that? What is, the, what is the why question? Why do I do that? Sometimes I find myself, when I have a particular action, I've learned how to ask myself, wait, why did I respond that way? Was I, was I feeling hurt? Was I feeling, was I feeling defensive? What, what was the reason that I responded in that way? The second question is, how could knowing you are always, that you always have God's acceptance and love change the way you seek the approval of others? If you really live in the confidence that you are loved, that will change how you interact with those around you. So I wanted to uh, encourage you that God does love you in unconditionally, that you do have his uh, total affirmation and, and adoration. And I hope that becoming a reality in your life will help you as you interact with those around you and give you the confidence in your identity to be able to engage the world and those around you in a, in a much more life-giving way. I hope this has helped. I hope this is something that you'll be able to reflect on during this week. It's an ongoing reflection. I mean, like I said, even at my age, this is a reflection that I constantly have. And I think it's, it's good to be able to 
come back to it occasionally and one, reaffirm the knowledge that God loves us and two, look for things that maybe I've been doing that I'm seeking the approval of others because of maybe the insecurity that um, have I not been acting in such a way that I think God always loves me. So there you have it. Um, as always, let us close in a moment of prayer. And I think today, I just love the prayer of St. Francis, which we do occasionally. Let's say it together as you, as you feel comfortable. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so seek to be consoled as to console, to be, uh, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. I hope you have an enjoyable experiential learning days opportunity, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.